So good morning to everyone. Welcome to this first session on uh, innovation, investment, and productivity. Um, you don't have to vote for the posters now. You can wait until the end of the session. Um, and um, I see very much our, our contribution here on this session as uh, setting the stage, uh, in a sense, for everything that will follow. Um, we want to understand better the uh, long-term drivers of uh, prosperity in advanced economies uh, across production factors. So we'll do it in two steps. We'll first have a look at uh, employment uh, with uh, David's paper. Uh, and then uh, we'll have a look into uh, investment and, and capital accumulation. And that's with, uh, with Thomas' uh, paper. Um, and uh, we want um, to have a thorough discussion on facts uh, so that any further policy discussion will be informed by facts. So that's really the way I see the contribution of this panel. Um, the one important feature uh, of both papers, actually, is that both uh, have a, an important uh, cross-sectional dimension, um, which will allow us, hopefully, to also have a discussion on the, uh, on the uh, distributional implications of productivity growth uh, across sectors. That's what's in the papers, but also possibly across individuals and across space, uh, which uh, will maybe also shed light on the uh, political dynamics which were uh, hinted at by, uh, by Ben Bernanke in his speech yesterday night. Um, we have, uh, so as I said, we have two uh, papers to, uh, to start the discussion. So the first uh, paper is by, uh, by David Otter, uh, who is the, um, one of the leading uh, labor economists, um, Ford Professor of Economics at the MIT, uh, Associate Head of the MIT Department of Economics, uh, David uh, will be uh, commented upon by Dietmar uh, Harhoff, uh, who is the uh, a director at the Max Planck Institute for Innovation uh, and Competition, uh, and a uh, honorary professor for entrepreneurship and innovation at the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich. Am I right? Yes. Okay. Um, and also uh, chairing the, um, the Commission of Experts for Research and Innovation for the uh, German uh, federal government. Um, and the second paper will be presented by, uh, by Thomas Philippon. Thomas is a professor of finance at New York University. Um, he's uh, also serving on the Monetary uh, Policy Advisory Panel at the uh, Fed uh, New York. Uh, and uh, if, I'm, if I'm right, you're also a member of the uh, French Prudential and Resolution Authority, um, which we're not discussing this morning. Um, and uh, Thomas will be uh, discussed by, uh, by Janice Eberly, uh, who's been the uh, James and Helen Russell Distinguished Professor of Finance at the Kellogg School of Management at uh, Northwestern University, uh, and also served as Assistant Secretary to the Treasury and Chief Economist for the Department of the Treasury uh, from uh, 11 to 13. So a great, uh, a great set of uh, uh, presenters and discussants, uh, and we start with, uh, with David. Uh, uh, David, uh, you have 25 minutes. Thank you so much. Do I go to the podium, I hope? Great. Uh, oh, uh, sure. Why not? Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you. Good morning. It is a delight to be here. Uh, thanks to the European Central Bank. Uh, thank, to, thank you to uh, President Draghi, to, to Ben Bernanke. Uh, this is, uh, uh, it's an honor to be this uh, contributor. I'm looking forward to all the discussions. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Anna Solomons of Utrecht in the Netherlands. Uh, and the question of our paper is, uh, does productivity growth threaten employment? Or uh, the shorthand term we're using for this is the robotic apocalypse, or if you like, the robocalypse. And so uh, a subtitle of our paper is Robocalypse Now. Uh, there is a long-standing concern that automation uh, threatens employment. Uh, we can look back a couple hundred years. Uh, of course, you're all familiar with the Luddites, skilled weavers in the 19th century who rose up against the power frame, uh, potentially threatening their artisanal jobs, correctly, in fact. Um, but you don't have to go very far back in history to see examples. Uh, U.S. Secretary of Labor James Davis in 1927 warned about the scrappage of men uh, and uh, was concerned that labor needs a new outlet. Uh, in 1964, President Johnson formed a Blue Ribbon Commission 
on technology, automation, economic progress, uh, the productivity, they were dealing with the productivity problem of the time. The productivity problem, as you all know, was that productivity was rising too fast. Uh, and they were concerned that there wouldn't be enough demand. Uh, and so employment would fall. Uh, in 1982, Nobel laureate Vasily Leontiev uh, warned that the role of workers will inevitably diminish. People will be akin to horses put out to pasture. And of course, uh, there's no question right now that we are in an era of similar concern, an era of uh, people asking, uh, is the robocalypse upon us? Uh, from the perspective of citizens and policymakers and intellectuals, the, this concern seems immediate. Uh, the more work's done by machines, the less work done by people, potentially. And we even have the legendary favor, fable of John Henry, the steel driving man who faced off against the steam powered hammer in laying railroad ties. And you'll remember he beat the steam, steam powered hammer, but then he laid down his hammer and he died. Uh, professional economic opinion has always countered uh, with three different arguments. One is that demand might be quite, quite elastic. You might see employment growth in advancing sectors. So this figure from James Besson shows you the trajectory of employment in textiles, cottons, and fibers, and also primary iron and steel over more than a century. And you see in the initial phases of rising productivity, there's enormous consumer surges in demand, unmet need. Uh, employment rises incredibly quickly with innovation. But then eventually, you hit a peak where demand is somewhat saturated and further increases in labor productivity eventually cause these sectors to diminish. So one possibility is that demand will respond directly. Uh, another, of course, going back to Colin Clark, is that uh, rising consumer incomes will create new demands, will move the locus of consumption from goods to services, for example. Finally, going back to Baumol in 1967, we may have sectoral reallocation. Uh, advancing sectors, sectors that have rise, rapid rise in productivity, may see falls in employment, but then we may see compensatory effects elsewhere. Um, I would say that economists are losing confidence in these long-held theories. More and more, we see economists saying, this time could be different. Uh, sort of exhibit the first horseman of the robocalypse, I would say, is that uh, labor's share of national income is falling across a large number of countries. Perhaps this is the first evidence that machines are, in fact, wholesale eliminating uh, the value of labor in the economy. But you don't have to look at the aggregate data. Uh, we, we know all around us that we are in an age of brilliant machines, to use the words of uh, Brynja Olsen and McAfee. Uh, computers are managing financial portfolios. They're beating Go players. Thank you, Hal. Uh, they, uh, uh, websites and drones are eliminating sales workers and warehouse workers, and robots are leaving the assembly lines, perhaps uh, coming for our jobs. And theoretically, uh, an emerging understanding makes clear this can happen in canonical models Technological uh, capital advancement, uh, uh, technological change is always labor augmenting. And economical models are always full employment models. So only good things can happen when productivity rises. But we, we now recognize machines can directly replace, replace specific job tasks. They can substitute for some workers, potentially complement each other, complement others. And there are several recent sort of theories of labor immiseration. One has to do with market failures, with the failures of intergenerational investment, like the work by Sachs and Kotlikoff or Berg et al. Another is what we call the no place to hide models, where there's just more and more task encroachment, and eventually, you know, the last worker is highly productive until he's out of the job as well. Uh, the third, uh, uh, very sophisticated paper by Asimoglu and Restrepo, looks at uh, two contravailing forces. On the one, you have machines uh, uh, successively replacing uh, codified tasks. On the other, new tasks are created as labor becomes abundant. Those two might cancel each other out. There might be a balanced growth path, or there might not. We can't be sure. Uh, the evidence does not yet strongly support the labor immiseration view, but it's early days. There's a vast literature that makes clear that computerization has been skill biased, but that's really not about the overall employment impacts of technological change. There is some recent evidence, a paper by Alexis uh, Alexopoulos and Cohen finds that technological progress in the 10s and 20s, uh, first decades of the century, uh, was strongly employment creating. But that was the first decade of the previous century. So it may not be as relevant to now. Uh, work by uh, my co-author Anna Salomons and her co-authors finds that the employment reducing effects of so-called routine replacing technical change have been offset by commens compensatory demand and spillover effects across uh, regions of Europe. Focusing specifically on robotics, which a lot of people are speaking about, in fact, you see many, many more articles about robots than you'll see robots in the course of a day. Uh, a paper by Greats and Michaels finds that across Europe, 
Industrial robots are raising wages, raising value added, and raising demand for skilled workers. But using a variant of the same data, Asimoglu and Restrepo uh, find that in the US, areas susceptible to robotization are seeing falling employment and falling wages. Our paper asks, in a very broad brush way, is recent labor augmenting technical progress eroding employment? Specifically, does productivity growth cause advancing industries, by which I mean industries experiencing rising productivity, to grow or to shrink? Do cross-industry spillovers offset or augment these direct own industry effects? And what's the net effect if they do? Has this relationship changed in the 2000s? And is productivity growth skill biased? In other words, should we be worried only about the number of jobs or also the type of jobs and who can access them? So our approach is very broad brush. We're going to look across 19 countries, 28 industries, and 37 years. We're going to focus on overall productivity growth measured as either output per worker, value added per worker, or total factor productivity. And we're going to look at employment by industry, employment to working age population, consumption, just to corroborate the productivity effects, uh, skill inputs within industries, and then sectoral shifts that may shift demand for skills. And we're going to do that uh, in the course of 17 minutes. Um, so let me start with the big picture. At the aggregate level, this goes back to uh, many people will know this, but Francis and Rome is one. It, it appears that productivity growth is employment augmenting. In countries where we see rising labor productivity or rising total factor productivity, we see employment to population rates rise. We see that in the big five European countries in the US. We see that across continental Europe. Um, we see that in Asia. So uh, historically, this time series of evidence says, well, look, we ought to be welcoming productivity growth. But that doesn't fit with many people's intuitions when they see their own jobs potentially replaced by automation. So we're going to zoom in at the industry by country by year level. We're using data from the EU CLEMS for 1970-2007. I will say uh, uh, in the course of a, of a long haul flight, my co-author Anna Salomons also updated our analysis through uh, 2014. So at the end of the talk, I'll tell you what we find. Uh, so 19 countries, 28 industries. Um, we also use additional measures from the world input output tables to look at consumption responses. Um, so the first question we want to ask is, do advancing industries grow or shrink? To ask that question, we're going to estimate a stacked first difference model, the log change in employment in industry I and country C in year T regressed on a bunch of uh, uh, control variables, dummy variables, and then the ch contemporaneous change in log labor productivity in that same country industry year. And um, we're going to ask what happens to industry employment on average as we see productivity rising. Now, you should say, well, what should happen? Well, three things could happen, at least. Um, in the kind of lump of labor world in which output demands are fixed, we should get a coefficient of negative one. Uh, doubling of labor productivity should reduce employment by half. Uh, in the kind of demand surge model, it's possible that rising productivity would actually cause such a large consumption response that we would see employment rise. And the third is somewhere in between the kind of Baumol view that we will see shrinkage in advancing sectors, possibly offset by elsewhere, possibly not. What does happen? What does happen is robustly, clearly, no matter how we specify it, industries that see rising productivity see falling employment. That's true uh, in different periods. It's true whether we measure uh, productivity using gross output, using value added, using total factor productivity doesn't matter what set of fixed effects we put in, it's very clear. Rising productivity lowers industry employment. In fact, that's true across all of the 28 industries that comprise the private sector economy in our data. Um, so you can understand why people worry about the employment consequences of productivity growth, because they see it right in front of them. You know, clearly, you can produce your way out of a job. You can become so productive that you're no longer needed. And that's the partial equilibrium effect that people are going to see. No one sees general equilibrium effects, right? We write them down, but you're not going to see, you don't say, well, you know, rising, employment, rising output in my sector will create jobs elsewhere. May or may not happen, but you're not going to see that. Um, now, let me just quick reality check. Is there something mechanical about this? Perhaps, you know, we're looking at employment on one side, labor productivity on the other. Maybe they just negatively co-vary because of measurement error. We check that. We have instrumental variable strategy. But let me just show you the dual of this, which is the consumption response. And we see that a 10% rise in labor productivity uh, typically leads to about a 3 or 4% rise in consumption of industry outputs. So two things are happening. Productivity is rising. 
output is rising, consumers are, are, are uh, you know, ultimately consuming more of the good, and employment is falling. So it's a convex combination of the two, um, what you might expect. Um, and this reminds us of something that you all know by way of background, which is unbalanced growth. We've had enormous productivity growth in manufacturing, in primary sectors like uh, mining, utilities, and construction, much less so in education and health, in uh, uh, low-tech services like restaurants, in high-tech services like finance. And as productivity has growth, as has accelerated or, or, or uh, accumulated in those sectors, employment has fallen. So the share across uh, these 19 countries of manufacturing employment has fallen by 15 percentage points between 1970 and 2000, with growing employment in uh, services, in education, and in health. So that leads us to ask, uh, how do we put together the, at the aggregate level, we see this positive relationship between employment and productivity growth. At the industry level, we see a strongly and robustly negative effect. Um, how are these two related? Well, perhaps there are employment spillovers elsewhere. This could happen through rising final demand, i.e. rising consumer incomes causes growth uh, in demand for other sectors, or through inter-industry inter demand linkages. We're not, we don't model those. We're, we're taking a reduced form approach for, in this paper. We'll, we'll look into that later. So we're gonna use simultaneously industry level and country level data to estimate the relationship between, between employment in my industry, productivity growth in my industry, and simultaneous productivity growth everywhere else in the economy, the leave out productivity growth, um, to ask whether we see countervailing effects. So this is what you see. These direct effects, the own industry productivity effects are strongly negative. And that's true if we look at gross output, at value added, if we look peak to peak or trough to trough. However, the spillover effects are positive and always strongly significant, and in fact, uh, almost uh, identical and opposite in sign to the direct effects. And so the net effect is in every case weakly positive, not always statistically significant, saying that effectively, uh, these own industry effects are compensated by rising employment elsewhere in the economy. Productivity is, is good, but not for the workers in the sector in which it's occurring, at least not in terms of numerical employment. It probably is good for, for wages and many other things. Um, now, that seems like good news, but you might say, well, it's pretty aggregate. You know, doesn't it matter where the productivity growth takes place? Is all productivity growth equal? Should I be equally happy about mining versus restaurants versus healthcare? Um, and you would think that the spillovers and the direct effects would vary across sectors. They would, uh, one is, if a sector is a larger piece of the economy, productivity growth there frees more income for consumption. Uh, product market competition may differ, so the price effects may differ and therefore the spillovers. Uh, also, international integration and production chains may mean that productivity growth in services has different effects from productivity growth in uh, traded sectors. So we're gonna allow those direct effects and spillovers to differ by sector using five sectors, uh, mining, utilities, and construction primary, then manufacturing, education, health, and then we break services into two others, low tech, which are uh, restaurants, hotels, et cetera, and then high tech, finance, business, uh, telecoms. And uh, this is just a, a variant of the model previously, but now we add uh, more, uh, uh, less structure, so we can, uh, we can allow these effects to differ by sector. What we find is there really is important heterogeneity, both in the direct effects, the employment reducing effects, and the spillover effects. Interestingly, the smallest direct effects are in manufacturing, suggesting that demand is relatively elastic for manufactured goods. Prices fall, and you buy an even larger television set. Uh, the uh, demand is quite elastic, actually, in many services. Uh, maybe people have finite demand for uh, health care, although the evidence in the US is that they don't. Uh, the spillover effects uh, also vary, and notably, we find almost no positive spillover from productivity growth in primary sectors, some from manufacturing, and very large effects from productivity growth in low-tech services, which is important. Those are a big part of the economy. In some sense, that's good news because uh, there, there's potential there. You can't just add those up uh, because what happens depends on the size of those sectors, the productivity growth in those sectors. So we do that for you. Um, uh, we just uh, take those coefficients, look at the cumulative productivity change in each of these sectors, the implied direct effects, the implied spillover effects, and ask what do they imply for employment to population in net? Well, if you look at the direct effect, the Baumol effect, we see that productivity growth 
has reduced employment per population or notionally in every sector, most strongly in low-tech services and in manufacturing. In manufacturing, because there's been so much productivity growth, in low-tech services because demand is so uh, 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 inelastic, so that uh, the, the, uh, there, there's a strong employment response. Adding those up, if there was only the direct effect of rising productivity in own, own sectors, the aggregate effect would be to reduce the employment to population on average across these countries by about 15 percentage points, quite substantial. But now if we look at the spillover effects, not surprisingly, they're positive. That doesn't have to be true. They're not constrained to be positive. The largest spillovers are coming from low-tech services and also from manufacturing. It has a modest spillover, but it's, uh, it's had enormous productivity growth. So if you put those together, the net effects are positive. Uh, we, we say, uh, our, our estimates say holding all else constant, rising productivity over these 37 years would be expected to raise employment to population ratios by about six percentage points. Um, notice, by the way, that it's the, the effect of mining utilities instruction is negative. There's no positive spillover. Uh, and then uh, other sectors contribute a great deal. Education and health contributes very little because, as we know, there's been almost no productivity growth in those sectors. Um, so now, you, uh, and this is true if we look across countries as well. We do this exercise for, uh, for the big countries in our data. And if you ask, well, how do these implied effects on employment population coming from rising productivity, how do they compare to what's actually occurred? Well, in most of the countries in our sample, overall employment to population has risen. But of course, it's risen because of rising female employment. It's, uh, and the changes uh, coming from rising productivity are modest. They say that rising productivity has generally pushed for more employment. That's good. Um, but it's not the predominant factor that's leading to rising employment. Uh, but in general, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a tailwind uh, that pushes towards more, uh, more formal sector jobs. You say, well, what's the biggest predictor of rising employment? Well, of course, the biggest predictor of rising employment is uh, rising population. Uh, and of course, that seems tautological. Uh, you know, big countries have more jobs. Uh, we know that's true. But it's, it's not completely. Uh, it actually underscores an important economic point, which is that each person who enters the economy is a consumer. But if they're going to be a consumer, they're likely to need to be a worker as well. And so each, worker, each person is both a supplier and demander. And so it's, it's, not, uh, it's not automatic, but it makes a lot of sense that as, as people enter the economy, uh, employment rises. And over the time period we look, the, the coefficient on population growth is about one with respect to overall employment growth. Um, so now, uh, two final questions I want to address. One. Is this time period different? Uh, have things changed? And two, should we worry about jobs per se or skills? So uh, to ask if this time period is different, we do the same exercise, but now we allow the effects to differ by decade, both the direct effects and the spillover effects. And what you see is the direct effects appear pretty stable, uh, maybe a little bit more negative in some periods. However, it is the case, if you look at the, compare the 70s, which is the blue bar, the 80s is the yellow bar, the 90s is the red bar, and 2000s is the green bar, the spillover effects appear more modest. And in fact, the net effect is weakly negative for the period of 2000 to 2007. So there's some evidence that the virtuous relationship between productivity growth and employment growth has broken down. However, I will note that was also true that the 1980s had a, uh, the yellow bar, had a smaller spillover effect. So this period doesn't look especially different from the 1980s. Moreover, uh, we did, uh, uh, using the, a different CLEMS data set, uh, run this analysis for the most recent uh, 17 years, 15 years. And what you find is if you look peak to peak or trough to trough, again, the, the net relationship between rising productivity and rising employment is positive. If you average over the Great Recession, everything goes to hell. Uh, but that's a, uh, it's not clear how you interpret that. Uh, overall, we don't find strong evidence to suggest uh, that this, you know, that we should, that the productivity has become uh, the enemy of employment. Um, so now let me turn to, I think, what we think of as a, a probably even more fundamental point and a little bit less self-evident, which is uh, the relationship between productivity growth and skill demands. So labor productivity growth could affect skill demands in two different ways. 
One is it could just be skill biased, that where sectors see rising productivity, they start eliminating low skill workers prior to middle skill workers, prior to higher skill workers. Quantitatively, we do not find that's important. We know computerization has been skill biased, but we don't see evidence that where uh, overall labor productivity is rising, firm uh, industries are differentially substituting away from one skill group towards another. But there's another channel that could be important, which is this unbalanced growth that as high advancing sectors shrink, if their skill mix is different from the rest of the aggregate economy, that may shift aggregate demand for skills in a non-neutral way. So let's be clear. Even uh, if, if, if uh, growth was balanced, it's still the case that the contraction and expansion of sectors causes economic pain. It's not Pareto improving except in a frictionless world. Right? So still, it means lots of labor, labor reallocation. But then if those sectors differ in their skill mixture, that's not even Pareto improving in a frictionless world because it's going to shift aggregate demand towards for or against specific skill groups. And we know that the fastest productivity has occurred in primary sectors, manufacturing, uh, utilities, and so on, and also, uh, excuse me, uh, utilities, mining, and so on, and also in manufacturing, uh, which means, and those are relatively low skill intensive sectors, so you would tend to intuit that that unbalanced growth would be skill biased. And that is what we see uh, if we just run through the same calculations and reweight industries according to the initial skill employment shares. What we see is that the overall effect of rising productivity has been to increase the, uh, the sort of uh, aggregate demand for the top tercile of skills by about 10 percentage points in this period versus about five percentage points for low and medium skill workers. So even though productivity growth has been employment augmenting, it's much more shifted the locus of employment towards more skill intensive sectors. If you look across countries, you see this broadly. In the US, what's interesting is that the greatest growth has been for low and high skill workers with the weakest effect on middle skill workers, suggesting a form of employment polarization. So the productivity growth uh, rising employment, the unbalanced sectoral reallocation that occurs has been skill shifting. So let me uh, just summarize. Um, so is productivity growth threatening employment? No, not so far. Employment sh is shrinking in advancing sectors, but the spillovers uh, are offsetting in lagging sectors. The net effect is that productivity growth, growth modestly contributes to rising employment of population and rising consumption. And let me be clear, this is, uh, you know, the, the sort of class of models I was raised on, uh, this had to, you know, the answer was uh, tautologically yes. These are full employment models. All productivity growth is labor augmenting. That had to occur. Uh, a new class of model says lots of things could happen. Machines and workers can compete directly. You can have a, 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 a case occur where there's just no tasks in which labor is competitive. People become like horses. Um, our evidence suggests that the uh, our evidence does not constrain uh, either of those cases to occur. So far, we find that the, the neoclassical wisdom is holding. However, that doesn't uh, eliminate the concern that people have in the sense that it really is the case where productivity rises, employment contracts, and that leads to painful reallocations, even if the net effect is positive. Um, is it changing? You know, I, you know, I said not robocalypse now. Perhaps it's robocalypse later. Uh, the virtuous relationship may have weakened a bit in recent years. But then it seems to be rebounding. I think, I think the jury is out on that. The distribution of productivity growth across sectors matters. The largest spillovers we find are from services. And that's good news. Because as the, robotics, as the robots come off factory floors, where are they going to end up? They're going to end up in restaurants. They're going to end up in hotels. They're going to end up in vehicle driving. Uh, if these estimates hold, those are the sectors that have the largest spillovers. That productivity growth could be on employment augmenting, although not in the sectors where it occurs. Um, Finally, what's good news for employment is not necessarily good news for all workers. These skill impacts of sectoral re reallocation are non-neutral. And this underscores something which I think many of us have been aware of for a long time, that the challenge is not the quantity of jobs, it's the quality of jobs. There are many high-skilled jobs being created. There are many fewer workers who are qualified for that work. And meanwhile, the residual sector that's growing are many in-person services, food service, cleaning, security, home health aides, and those jobs uh, are numerous, they're plentiful, but they are not intrinsically not, they're intrinsically low wage because they use a generic skill set, 
And that is a concern that I think our paper underscores that uh, the opportunity set is quite polarized and employment is being created, but the jobs uh, that are the most appealing are the ones that are much less available. Okay, uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, look forward to the uh, comments uh, from Dietmar Harhoff. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, that's already a lot of food for, for discussion. We're very eager to, to listen to Dietmar's comments. The, the way we'll have the discussion is we have the two papers being presented and then commented. And then um, I'll open the, uh, the discussion with the audience. Uh, I just give a chance to the, uh, for the authors to uh, reply to the comments. If you, if you feel urged to uh, object or comment on something Dietmar said, you will have the floor. Uh, and then we'll open a general discussion after the two papers. So Dietmar, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. I hope objections will not be necessary. But uh, let me start by thanking the organizers for having me. Uh, and uh, pointing out that they encouraged me to put on two hats because, as you noted, there is a, a presentation on productivity and employment. There's one on investment, but the overarching title is also innovation. So I'll say a little bit about innovation as well to link these things together. Uh, and in order to do that, um, I'll provide you with a little bit of context um, because I'm talking a lot to people who do innovation and who also uh, build the robots, uh, not so much in the service sector yet, but uh, in, in other areas. Uh, I'll comment extensively on this really great paper. I think it provides a wonderful foundation for the discussion. Congratulations to the authors. And now I'll come back to the innovation point and uh, uh, to productivity, because uh, despite of the hardship that productivity growth may uh, cause, we want to have it. And uh, especially in Europe, as was pointed out yesterday by Mario Draghi, we haven't had all that much of it, and we may want to have more of it. And there's some hard work to be done to have it. So uh, innovation and productivity growth. Europe has not delivered. We heard that. I will not go into that. Uh, we have relatively stable structures in those sectors that deliver productivity growth. However, if you look more closely, these are challenged right now. And these are challenged by very disruptive uh, things. We call them digital transformation and other things. They are largely driven by successful non-European players. That by an, in and of itself is not a problem. We have had international division of labor for a long time. Uh, but uh, that puts uh, many large European corporates and SMEs in follow-up positions across industries because this is disruptive change in the sense of a general purpose technology. So what we, we see right now, uh, not just in the corporate sector, but also in the government sector, is lots of experiments. What we thought was the holy grail of innovation management and innovation processes has been lost. People are experimenting because they don't quite know how to deal with this drastic change. They deal with, uh, they, they experiment with startups, with accelerators, venture capital, open innovation. Uh, we'll hear later, I take it, about ecosystems. Uh, so all of these things are in a state of experimentation right now because there is fundamental uncertainty among policymakers. So it's uh, worse than that. Growth is not enough, but in some quarters, we also have declining trust in science and experts of any kind. That is not limited to the United States. You can show that in surveys. We respond. We have now the term inclusive growth that comes up. Citizen science, participatory approaches, uh, but those do not necessarily respond directly to the big challenges like installing new business model across the board. So I think that there are three short-term challenges in the digital realm that Europe faces, one among the SMEs. Uh, and there is evidence, I will not go into details here, that there is a little bit of a digital divide. That's how large corporations can handle this change, that the smaller ones, the SMEs, may have problems with that. We're working with startups and ecosystems, and ideally, of course, with market forces. And then there's a lot of digital infrastructure that we need and that isn't quite there yet. And whether governments as strategic innovators will be uh, an answer will certainly pop up in the panel discussion later on. This came up yesterday and brings us to the topic of the paper. Uh, the Guardian had these wonderful lists. You will see that central bankers are neither among the list of safest jobs nor among uh, the list of the least safe uh, jobs. I'm, I'm not quite sure how that is to security detail and so forth, but the automation principle is. But what we have here is essentially an example for uh, news 
uh, that has been around over the past uh, years. And all of this started, of course, with a study by Frey and Oswald, uh, who came up in 2013 with a study of 702 occupations and found that 47% of US workers would be at some risk if one looks at the possibility of automation in these jobs. There were other studies then by consultancies. The World Bank came out with one that had 57%. Uh, these are controversial, but they make their way into the press, and right now they shape the image of digital change. And I think that's very important for us to realize that uh, there is fear out there among people who read this. Now, there are more qualified studies. Uh, Ansett Al, for example, look at the occupational patterns and come up with a figure of 9%, which is a big difference to the 57 in the World Bank. I think it's fair to say that from studies of this kind, we simply cannot come up with safe estimates as to what the replacement potential is. Uh, and therefore, it is, I think, very, very good that um, David Otter and Solomon, uh, uh, Anna Solomon look at the uh, evidence in a slightly more reliable way. However, it's looking at the past. And that is, of course, uh, what we do here. Now, let's look at the setup. Both authors have made ample contributions to skill-biased and routine-biased change. Actually, David has led the conceptual development away from purely skill-biased to routine-biased. So there are many things to be commanded that predate this paper, but that are in the background. What we have here is a systematic attempt to estimate various effects in one model in order to allow for aggregation of the effects and, of course, in order to allow for comparison. Comparison across countries, across industries, and time periods. They use the CLAMS data. I think that's a prudent choice. Uh, they uh, set this up as country by country by year stacked first difference models. Uh, there's some experimentation in the background with IV approaches. They stick to the OLS estimation uh, later on. All of this is in reduced form. We, that comes with disadvantages, but that is sort of uh, by way of the territory that they choose. Uh, it's a very logical approach. Uh, I have a few quibbles, but I will communicate most of them uh, offline because they're really very few. You can talk about measurement issues. You could talk uh, about uh, or take more seriously the panel dimension here and, and uh, apply dynamic panel estimators or take this to the time series. Uh, one could try to decompose the productivity growth meaningfully in different components. All of this is work that goes beyond what they want to do here and that can build on this particular paper. Now, what are the main results of this conference paper? The first one is predictable. Own industry employment declines as labor productivity increases. And this is uh, a very stable finding that they test uh, and where they uh, have various robustness checks. They also show that there is a, uh, a consumption response, but nonetheless, there's a negative impact at the industry level, but not at the aggregate level, and they go on and try to explore why that is. And the argument is that productivity growth has important spillover effects into other sectors, and that these effects actually fully offset the negative internal effects, and that the net impact on employment and over population is uh, weakly positive. So they speculate on the sources. David said that already that uh, they do not go into that because uh, they're somewhat restricted what the uh, data can tell them here, but income effects or inter-industry demand linkages are the most probable candidates uh, here. They also point to important heterogeneity. Manufacturing, as David said, has uh, the smallest uh, own effect. Uh, I, I think calling it the least negative own effect uh, makes it maybe a little bit clearer what is meant. Uh, and low-tech services has the largest spillovers, which is interesting. So, uh, of course, this may all have changed over time, and fortunately, the data allows them to go after that. And I've copied from the uh, slides that uh, David uh, gave me uh, before one picture that I find particularly telling. And I have now chosen the version uh, where the uh, um, uh, productivity is measured in value-added rather than in uh, gross output. And this picture looks a little bit more intimidating than the other one, and maybe we want to discuss why this one uh, is not sort of the focus of the presentation uh, before, because what you see here is that things may have changed in the last decade under consideration here, 
or maybe over the, to the whole time frame, uh, depending on what you want to make out of this, the standard errors, in, especially in the external effect estimators, are fairly large. That is understood because that's sort of aggregating variables on the right-hand side, which makes them less, uh, less precise. And then you also get a relatively noisy overall effect. But if you want, you can interpret a time story into this particular pi uh, picture. So, uh, the conclusions that the authors draw are then not quite so strong as in the abstract of the paper. Does productivity growth threaten employment? Not so far. Uh, employment in advancing sectors shrinks. Uh, we, we have heard that. Uh, the net effect uh, is uh, productivity growth uh, modestly contributes to uh, rising employment to population as well as rising consumption. There is a concern about the 2000s. The distribution matters. Productivity growth in services produces the largest spillovers. We have heard that. And the authors then turn that into good news. Robotics have, um, may have potential to raise productivity in services. I would he put a little warning sign on this. Uh, this is based mostly on robotics, uh, on, on a view of robotics we have from other sectors. Whether that is the case, that's a sort of prediction into the future that's a little bit uh, speculative. Nonetheless, there's the virtuous story that David has described. And then he comes, I think, to the gist and to the policy concerns that we should have. Uh, the impact of skills is uh, non-neutral. Maybe we don't want to worry about the overall quantity of jobs, but due to sectoral shifts and other factors, there is an impact, particularly for low and medium skilled workers, that should concern us. So growth is not enough, to pick up what Ben Bernanke said yesterday. Uh, a minor point, uh, the polarization, dif uh, polarization differences are very interesting. You don't comment them extensively in the paper, but it might be nice to hear uh, uh, what uh, drives them. Okay, let's come back to the asymmetry, because I think that's a very important one. Growth is not enough. Uh, education and human capital format formation matter strongly, and so that puts us firmly back in an institutional game, namely how to deal with skill formation and education. Uh, how do we teach? Uh, how do we generate reliable insights on learning? Uh, and I think there is much to be done in this particular field. Now, technology itself may come a little bit to the rescue with MOOCs, with other forms of learning. But then there's also a very interesting observation that the market supplies interesting uh, skill upgrading models. Uh, if you have gone into San Francisco and have uh, gone to Galvanize, uh, which is a, uh, a organization that takes people in for three months and turns them into relatively capable Python programmers, uh, and I think that that is a very interesting short-term response that we should also look at here uh, in Europe. So, let me come back to innovation, because in any case, there's hardship here, there's need for prudent policy. Uh, we don't want to have, uh, we don't want to forego the productivity gains, so what do we do? Here's a list of policy options that OECD drew up in the future of productivity in 2015. And uh, I have sort of drawn up my own little list of what can be said positively or maybe not so positively for European institutions at this point in order to get at the added productivity and innovation. So I would note positively in response to we need improvement in funding of basic research. By the way, that is very interesting because we had a long time period where policy advisors were arguing in favor of more applied work, applied research. So I think we're doing nicely there in Europe with the ERC, 6,000 or 6,500 grants out by now. I think that that is doing very nicely. I think that we have made progress on global mechanisms to coordinate investment, uh, such as R&D tax incentives. We put a dampener on patent boxes, or we put, OECD did in the course of its uh, BAPS uh, uh, base erosion, profit shifting uh, considerations. We have harmonization of IPR systems in Europe to some degree. Unfortunately, the harmonized patent system is right now pending approval uh, because uh, there is a German case at the Supreme Court. Uh, OSD also advised to support diffusion from global frontier firms via trade, and I don't have to tell this audience that that is unfortunately a little bit under pressure uh, given political um, political developments. It would be nice to have a comprehensive trade agreement with Japan, maybe one that follows CETA in terms of design and so forth, which was 
after all, acceptable for large groups of the population in Europe. So then there is a concern of do not favoring uh, applied over basic research. I think that there's uh, some positive things to be said there. And of course, the call for reducing barriers to firm entry and exit, and that brings us back to the topic of the paper. For that, we do need labor market reforms in order to be able to handle those sectoral shifts and in order to have increased worker mobility. Uh, internationally, there is a little bit of a dampener there with Brexit, of course. Okay, let me wrap up. I have 18 seconds. Uh, to David and Anna, this is a great analysis of the impact of productivity growth on employment. I think it's very informative. Uh, and it also pulls out the, uh, the implications uh, regarding skill bias, routine bias, sectoral shifts, and so forth very, very nicely. Um, whatever is said, it may be a fortuitous relationship, but technical change has the potential of creating disruptions uh, and hardship. Uh, so apparently growth is not enough. And uh, to the Europeans, I can just say, uh, if we want to have more of productivity growth, uh, we still have some hard work ahead of us to get those innovation-related policies and institutions up to shape. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dietmar. And by the way, th thanks to both of you for, for sticking with the, uh, with the time uh, allocation. Uh, that's as much time that we give back to the audience. Um, or that belongs to the audience, actually. Um, Dietmar, I was, in, I was intrigued by your remark that central banking is not on the picture of the, of the safe jobs in face of technical change. But thinking about it uh, while, you, while you were speaking, I thought that was probably good news because given that central banking is obviously a, a service industry <laughs> and given the polar, polarization result that uh, David put forward, if we would be safe, that would mean that we, were, we are either very high skill or low skill, and that's not a question we want to ask ourselves. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, David, you want to have a chance to, to respond to some of Dietmar's point before we move on? Uh, I'll only take uh, one minute. Okay. Uh, first of all, I agree with what uh, Dietmar said, um, that you know, innovation is, is central. We're looking at the, out, the results of innovation, not the uh, inputs into innovation or the causes. Um, I agree there's, this is a very high level analysis, and there's lots of uncertainty. I, I do think. The, you know, what's happening in the 2000s, we, we could underscore that more. We don't want to raise alarm. Uh, you know, my uh, thesis advisor, Larry Katz, once said, you know, I, I love history and I love science fiction, but I think that history is a better guide to the future than is science fiction. And uh, so there's always a, a danger to, uh, to extrapolate too much from that. There's more to do here in terms of looking at the role of input-output linkages, the role of trade integration, and I think that's been extremely consequential for employment in the United States. Uh, for the role of population aging. And so I, I think we think this provides a foundation for looking at how these factors inter interact. I do just want to flag the, the Fry and Osborne results. They're extremely alarmist. They say, well, f you know, 43% of jobs are at risk of automation. Well, all jobs are at risk of, of automation. I mean, the truth is almost nothing that we do for a living now resembles what people did 100 years ago. You know, 40% of US employment was in agriculture in 1900. Now it's 2%. It would have been hard to predict that, you know, well, you know, when, once agriculture went away, people would be doing search, op search engine optimization for a living, but that's what occurred. Um, so that's a very, that is the most kind of mechanistic view of automation and really not representative of the dynamics. I think what is correct about that and what our paper underscores as well is even if the aggregate effects are positive, the reallocation is painful, especially if it moves quickly, and it may not be neutral. Even in a frictionless world, it may shift skill demands. And that's the pattern we have seen across the developed world over decades. And uh, I think there's every reason to, to continue to focus on the challenge of matching the set of human capital inputs to the labor market opportunities. Thank uh, you. David, D Dietmar made a, uh, what, I, what I found a very thoughtful remark on the sources of productivity, meaning labor productivity obviously can be TFP sure. or capital deepening. Uh, did you look into that? I mean, would well, you we, come to we different use three results? different measures of productivity, yeah. which are labor pro raw labor productivity, value added, and TFP. We didn't decompose where those are coming from, uh, and I, I think that's a, a very worthy topic. We wanted to use an encompassing measure rather than looking at specific episodes or incidents, um, but I, obviously, not all productivity growth needs to be the same. Thanks. So, Thomas, talking of capital deepening, 
The floor is yours. Well, good morning. Thank you uh, for being here. Thank you to the organizers for inviting us to write this paper. Thank you, uh, the ECB, President Draghi, and Benoit Curé for chairing the, the panel. So this is joint work with uh, Robin Dutling and uh, Herman Gutierrez, both are PhD students, Robin in Amsterdam, and uh, Herman with me at uh, NYU. So the focus of the paper is to understand investment dynamics in uh, Europe and in the US. So here on this graph, you have um, net investment relative to the stock of capital for Europe on the left and US on the right. So um, the series on the right for the US, actually that's part of a series of paper I've been writing uh, on the US, trying to understand why we see this downward trend in investment in the US. Um, and just to be clear, when I say investment, I mean all measured investment, including intellectual property and intangible investment, okay? So this includes structured equipment, software, as well as uh, R&D and uh, intellectual property uh, style investment. So there's this downward trend in the US, which I find striking and I, we try to explain. So we have a series of, pap of papers on the US and to some extent what we try to do in this paper is to replicate everything we've done in the US uh, in Europe. Okay, so Europe needs to be defined. Um, we're gonna use uh, various data sources and some of them restrict uh, the availability of some countries. So when it says EU claims, it means the eight largest uh, EU economies. And the UK we treat separately, which is not in this picture here, but throughout the talk you can think of it as the UK looks, it's like in between EU claims and the US, a bit more like the US. Okay, so I can tell you everything um, we find about the UK later. Um, so investment here includes intangible, uh, so it's not just physical investment. The other thing is we look both at growth and net investment. In the aggregate, it's kind of robust. It doesn't matter which one you look at. Sometimes measures of depreciation at the, at the more micro level are noisy. So we tend to focus on growth investment when we drill down to firm level investment. Um, so you see in both cases this uh, decline in investment, investment rate, okay? So the growth of, of capital is clearly much lower now than it was in the past. And the question is, is, is there a common cause for both or uh, is the story different for the US and for Europe? And so I'm gonna show you that, I'm gonna to explain to you what happened in the US, what happened in Europe, and in fact, the two stories are quite different. And the first place you can look at is what happened to profits over the same period of time. So profits in the US, the scale is a bit different. So this looks this look less volatile than this, but just because the scale is different. Uh, so profit in the U.S. have, of course, you know, taken a hit during the crisis, but they've recovered extremely fast. And in fact, today, they are, if you just accumulate the profits over a three-year moving average, they've never been higher in history, period. All right? So the profit rate, so this is measured as operating surplus over the, over the capital stock. Your, the, the profit rate of U.S. firm has never been higher in a persistent way. In contrast, in Europe, you see profit was kind of relatively stable, and then it took a big hit during the crisis and has not recovered since. Okay. So that already suggests that the reasons are gonna be different. One thing you can do is take the ratio of um, investment over profits and figure out you know, how much of their uh, cash flow do firms flow back in investment. Of course, that's cyclical. You always see the dip in the crisis, but in Europe, there is no obvious trend, maybe a small downward trend, but it's not very obvious. Uh, in the US, on the other hand, there's this continuous downward trend. So firms are plowing back less and less of their profits into investment. Of course, by accounting, that means what they are not putting in investment, they are paying as dividends or shares buyback. Okay, that's just by definition. Um, and final point to show you that the story is different in Europe and the US, it's Tobin's Q. So Tobin's Q is gonna be core of our analysis. So just a reminder, Tobin's Q is the value of the, the firm divided by the replacement cost of the stock of capital. And remember, again, the stock of capital includes intangible investment, brands, and stuff like that. Okay, so in, if Tobin's Q is more than one, that means you should invest because ex any extra dollar you put in capital is valued more than one dollar by the market. Okay, and conversely, if Tobin's Q is less than one, you should divest. Um, comparing the level of Q between Europe and the US is a huge pain in the neck because of the treatment, in particular, of the treatment of land. 
Okay, because if you think about the firm, you want to, of course, you have the, you know, you have the intellectual property, equipment structure, you also have the land that they own, and it's not treated exactly the same way. So it's hard to compare in levels uh, between the US and Europe. You have all the tables in the, in the paper to make the comparison. Um, but of course, the time series are very clear. So Q is high in the US. In fact, it's higher than it's ever been, except at the peak of the internet bubble. Okay. In Europe, on the other hand, Tobin's Q is pretty low. Okay. So that sounds like a simple um, point, but actually it has a very um, broad implications. Because broadly speaking, there are two kinds of theories you're gonna write down about investment. Some theories are gonna explain why you would have low investment rate because you have low Tobin's Q. Okay? And that includes every theory based on spread, risk premia, weak aggregate demand, with expected TFP growth. Every single one of these works through low Q and low investment. Okay? On the other hand, you could have low investment despite high Q, and that suggests the gap, and the gap could be explained by financial frictions by intangible investment, which is still not properly measured, despite all the effort we are making in improving measurement, uh, you still have uh, mismeasurement in intangible or different type of investment function. I, um, Jan has a paper on that. Um, or, and that's the story I'm gonna to push today, it's competition. Okay. If you have changes in the degree of competition, you typically move Q and investment in opposite direction. If competition goes down, profit rates go up, Q goes up because it capitalizes the rent, but investment goes down, of course. And so what's the story? Well, our story is that this is the EU. In other words, investment is in line with Q, and this is the US. Investment is low despite high Q because the US has become less competitive. That's what I'm gonna show you. All right, so just to show you that investment is in line with Q in Europe, this is what you predict using Tobin's Q. I showed you the two series separately before, so this is just if you regress one on the other. Try to predict investment at the very aggregate level for the whole uh, EU. Um, so it works pretty well. There's still this gap here, of course, suggesting some gap, of course. But then you look at the countries, and the gap is entirely driven by Spain and Italy, countries that we know have other types of constraints. If you remove Spain and Italy, then there is no residual. Okay? There is no residual. Investment is exactly where you would predict based on Q theory. In the US, on the other hand, you get that. This is what you would predict based on Q, and this is what actual investment is. This gap is large, persistent, and has a huge... I mean, if you believe the story I'm gonna tell you, there's massive welfare consequences. I'm gonna tell you that roughly speaking, K in the, UK, in the US right now is something like 5% or 4% below where it should be. Okay, that has massive implications for labor productivity and, and welfare. Okay, so why do I believe competition is the story? Okay, so now this picture doesn't look like much, but you wouldn't believe the amount of work you need to create that picture. Okay, so on this picture you have the Herfindel Index, for the US and for Europe in red and in green. So for the US, it is not too hard because we have pretty good firm level data. Um, this is based on the top 50 firm of each industry to, to avoid truncation effect for very small firms, but it's, it's robust to the way you define it. Um, so this, this, that's the simple Herfindel measure, not the one adjusting for common ownership, which we can discuss later. Um, very strong and continuous increase in concentration in the US. Over the same period of time, Europe sees decreasing concentration. Now you might ask, why do I have two curves for Europe? Well, because you can define Europe in two ways. You can look country by country, that's the red curve. You can compute the Herfindel for France and Germany and Italy separately, and then take the average across countries. Okay, so implicitly if you do that, you're treating each country as one market. The polar extreme, of course, you can really believe in the single market integration, in which case you would treat the entire Europe as one market. So for a particular industry, you would look at this industry, but you would look at players in all of the European countries to compute your Herfinder index. Now, mechanically, that Herfinder index is gonna be lower than the red one, um, but the trends are very similar, okay? So my sense is that uh, there's clearly a trend towards less concentration in Europe, both at the country level and at the EU level, and if anything, if you think about where, what we are doing at the same time, since we are integrating the market, over time, the green curve becomes more relevant relative to the red curve. So probably what we are doing is we are moving from the red to the green as we, as we go along. So I think the decline in concentration, the increase in competition in Europe is quite remarkable. And I'm gonna show you that this explains the different patterns of investment. Okay, so I won't spend too much time on 
the data, but uh, this is where the value added of the, the paper really is. Um, this is the list of countries I mentioned earlier, the eight countries that are part of the core sample for, for Europe. So we're gonna use country industry data. We have to, we're gonna use STAN and the claims to have, to have a longer time series. And then we're gonna to go to the firm level data where we have CompuStat Global and this monster here, Amadeus Orbis. And this is uh, where we, this would not have been possible without the help of Stedman and Carolina because um, the big difference between Europe and the US now in terms of research is the firm level data is so much better in the US. In Europe, we have this Amadeus Orbis data set, which is really of relative low, low quality, extremely difficult to use. But as it turns out, they have done an amazing amount of work to link and create long panels with actually correct firm level data. And thanks to their work, we can compute the Herfindel for Europe over time. So essentially, every time you see this firm level measure for Europe, what we did is they run our code on their data. Okay, so we, we are forever grateful. Um, and then some caveats about accounting standard, but that's mostly for, for the level, so it doesn't matter for what I'm gonna show. Okay, so I'm gonna show you two uh, sets of regressions. Um, the first is about the Herfindel. So here as well, background. Remember, I've done all of that for the US, okay? And for the US, we show that in the time series, you can explain where well investment is rising concentration, and then you can do the same at the industry level and at the firm level. In the US, investment, the gap between either profits or Q and investment, the gap is coming from industries that have become more concentrated over time, okay? And within industries, it's coming from the firm that have exceptionally high profitability within each industry, okay? So the question we had was, is the same true in Europe? It's interesting because in Europe, we don't see the overall trend, okay? So if anything, concentration in the aggregate is going down in Europe but there is still dispersion across industry. So you might ask, is it the case that, you know, industries that have become relatively more competitive faster than others, do they see more investment? Okay, so same exact regression we run in the US, we are running now in Europe, and this is the question you find on the Herfindel, okay? So these are industry country regressions, okay? And you see the very clear impact of the Herfindel on uh, investment controlling for Q, which is, by the way, this coefficient is very similar to the one we found in the US something of the order of four to five uh, percent with the right scaling. So that's the, the impact of the Herfindel. The uh, other thing that's important, obviously, is the uh, rising share of intangible. Okay, so we know that intangible investment is different. It could accumulate differently. It has di different depreciation rates, different adjustment costs. And there's a sense in which we are still not measuring it perfectly well. And therefore, you'd think that in industries where there is relatively higher share of intangible, you might miss more of the investment, okay? And indeed, that's correct. It's not overwhelming in terms of how important it is, but it is an important factor, okay? And both are very orthogonal. So in fact, you can see when you put up both of them together in the same regression, nothing changes. The point estimates are the same, the standards are the same. These are essentially orthogonal factors to a large extent. And um, the last thing I want to say also is we run these regressions. So this is for total investment, which includes tangible and intangible. We also run them separately for intangible, separately for tangible, and everything I'm showing you is robust to both cases. So this is at the uh, industry level, which is a natural place to, to check uh, the impact of competition. If you want to look at trade constraints, the more likely, um, the, the more natural specification is to look at firm level, okay? So again, the question is, in Europe, we see sometimes this residual, is it accounted for by credit constraints or banking crisis, okay? And the answer is yes, so you can see it here uh, in terms of the uh, firm level regression. So again, we have investment on the, on the left, we have Tobin's Q, which is always strong and significant, so. Um, but then, we have this extra bit here, which is, um, is your country in, reg in a recession? And do you have high leverage? And do you have short maturities? Or I guess here, long maturities, okay? And this, by the way, has been shown. There is at least a couple of papers by, from the ECB uh, showing that. I don't know, Luke is around here, so I think he has one paper showing that. So we are confirming uh, stuff that has been found already, um, which is that if you're in recession, obviously, it has an impact on you. If you enter the recession with a lot of debt, then you will hit harder, and if the debt is short term, you also hit harder. Or conversely, if you have long maturity, it dampens the impact of the debt, okay? That's well known. So that's for all countries. 
It turns out this is mostly concentrated among the, I don't know how you call it, a periphery country, or non-core country. So this is the GIPS effect. So if you're in one of these countries and you have a lot of debt to refinance, and uh, then you have a negative impact on your investment, if you have long maturity, that dampens the effect. Okay, that's exactly what you would expect. Again, going back to the macro now, the question is, if you put the pieces together, do you get a consistent story? Yes. So green here, these are the time effect that you would get from the residual of the regression year by year. Okay, so if you don't control for anything, you have the green curve, which is the strong decline in investment in Europe. Okay. If you just take into account Q and firm age, uh, you almost get rid of the trend. Okay, there's still a little bit here. So uh, the, 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 uh, there is no abuse trend in the time effect anymore. If you add the intangible share and the financial constraint, which mostly hit in the GIPs, then um, the scale again is different. So this variety is, is also reduced. But you can see there is absolutely no trend left. Okay? Or in other words, in Europe, I can explain in investment at the firm level, at the industry level, at the country level for the Europe as a whole, with just the standard Tobin skew and a measure of financial constraint. Okay. In, in the US, uh, it's the opposite, in fact. Tobin skew is high, it's never been higher, almost, except in 99, and despite that, investment is low. So what's going on? So we show in the other paper that it's really well explained by uh, lack of competition. And there's something that I wanted to do, which is, this concentration actually is not uniform across industries in the US. And we looked in particular at some industries where concentration has gone up the most. So this is what we've done here. We've picked the US, we looked at the top five industry by increasing concentration in the US, okay? So the red curve here for the US, these are the industries that have become the most concentrated in the US. And that's their average share fin also. Mechanically, that goes up a lot. They were selected on that basis. Now we looked at the exact same industries in Europe. And this is what happened. That's amazing. And then even more amazing, that's the investment rate in the US and in Europe. It's actually higher in Europe. Remember, this is the, the, the raw data, not controlling for anything. These guys are in crisis, their profits are lower, and they're still investing more than the US counterpart. The only difference between these industries, they are the same technology. In one case, there is strong competition. In the other case, there is no strong competition. So that's my first big takeaway on, on competition. The second thing I'm gonna talk about is intangible investment. Uh, Jan is the world expert on that, so I just want to highlight things that are a bit uh, different and more like the comparison with the US. Because that's one place where we know, of course, that the US was way ahead of Europe, at least some years ago, okay? So we had a basic question, or actually two basic questions. Does intangible explain part of the mismeasurement of investment? Yes, it's there. Uh, it's significant, it's not the overwhelming factor, but it's an important factor. But the more important question from my perspective was, uh, is Europe closing the gap with the US in terms of intangible investment? Okay? And the answer is yes. It's very hard to measure properly uh, because it would be nice if uh, national account uh, people could agree on depreciation rate between the two uh, regions so we could compare the stocks as well, but this is what we've done. So this is, uh, the US is in red, uh, Europe is in green, and the difference is in blue. So this is using claims, so you can see this. So there's a clear decline in the difference, okay, so catching up of Europe, based on claims data, where the depreciation is really a bit messy. This is based on CompuStat Global, so firm level data, same exact calculation, but in this case, it looks like the convergence is essentially done, okay. So according to claims, we've, we've uh, closed the gap, but there's still a gap. According to CompuStat Global, the gap is gone to zero. Which one to believe? Honestly, given the, uh, it's somewhere in between. I, I really believe that. I think these guys are too optimistic. These guys are too pessimistic because of the depreciation rates. I think we are somewhere in between. So we are uh, closing the gap in terms of intangible investment with the US. But the thing that's amazing is how we do it, actually. So this one takes, uh, I'm fine, okay. Takes one minute to explain because there is lots of information, okay. But that's a really cool picture. You really understand it. So these are vintages. Okay, each, each line is a vintage. Okay. The question we're trying to understand is how, so both economies, both Europe and the US, obviously are ramping up their intangible investment, are becoming more intangible intensive. The question is how do you achieve this transition? Okay. In the aggregate, it's very similar. The capital share of intangible has gone up roughly the same amount in both cases. Okay. But the way it happened at the micro level is very different and interestingly different. So these are the vintages. 
So uh, this is by cohort of firms for when they were born, essentially, okay? And or when they enter the, the, when we classify as entering the data, okay? And this is for Europe and this is for the US. So for the US, what you see is that given a vintage, you, your intangible intensity is roughly stable over time, okay? And the way the US economy has achieved the increase in intangible is by each new cohort being more intensive than the previous one. Okay? So the intangible intensification of the US is through the extensive margin. Okay? Entry of high intensity intangible firms. Okay? So cohort after cohort, the thing goes up. But each cohort is relatively flat over time. And this process mostly took place in the 1990s, okay? and early, perhaps early 2000. Okay? So it started earlier than in Europe, and, started, and it was done differently. In Europe, on the other hand, so you can see it starts later, okay? And also it takes place within each firm, okay? So each cohort is becoming more intangible intensive, okay? It's the incumbents that are becoming more intangible intensive in, in Europe, okay? So I think there are two implications. One is, of course, it went fast in the US, presumably because these guys can adjust faster than the incumbents. <coughs> so that explains some of the time lag in history. Um, but if you look at now what's going on today and you compare uh, where we are today, the two places look very similar in this dimension, although they achieve the dynamics in very different ways. All right, so let me wrap up. Um, so what's the summary? We have weak investment in the US and in Europe. Our interpretation, however, is that the causes are different. In the US, it's structural. Firms have firm in most industries, except for the ones that are subject to uh, foreign competition, which we analyze in details in the other papers. Uh, but in most industries, firms have weak incentive to invest because nobody is threatening their market share. In Europe, investment is low for cyclical reasons. It's purely a leftover a legacy of the Eurozone crisis. So if that view is correct, now that the risk premia are coming down, then we would expect a pickup of investment in Europe. In the US, on the other hand, I just can't possibly imagine what it would take to make firms invest. They have record high profit, record high valuation, zero funding cost, and they still they don't invest. So give me a factor that would change that. I don't see one. Okay. Um, intangible, we are catching up. The, the catch-up was very uh, different, as I showed you, income versus startups. Broadly speaking, I think this suggests a role for uh, product market regulation and antitrust. Okay? Because at the end of the day, you might ask yourself, okay, why is it that we see these diverging trends between Europe and the U.S.? So I'm going to show you two pictures. The first one is the OECD Product Market Regulation Index. And I, you know, when I, I grew up as an economist, uh, it was all about, oh, Europe is too regulated. So every OECD report every year was like, you should, you should remove this product market regulation. Okay, so we're always beating up on the European countries to do something about their product market regulation. And the truth is, they did. Okay, so these are the eight European countries in our data. Remember, the OECD PMR indexes are, are uh, every five years, okay? So that's why you only have four of them here. Um, so they were, every single one of them, every single one of the eight countries was above the US in terms of product market regulation in 1997, okay? They went down over time. Today, the last vintages, every single one of these eight countries is below the US in terms of product market regulation. So I think that's an important factor. And the other one, of course, is antitrust. Antitrust is a complicated object to measure. So this is one attempt. Okay, so here we have my Herfindahl for the US in red. Okay. And in green, you have one measure of antitrust. And caveat, that's not obvious, that's the best one. This is just counting the number of actions taken under section two of the Sherman Act, which is the act you use to prosecute antitrust in the US. Okay, there are other measures. You can look at fine. You can look at people going to jail. This is one measure, which is you count how many Sherman Act, uh, Chapter 2, uh, are, are started, investigations. Okay. And there is a clear negative correlation between the two. Right? So over the past 10 years, essentially antitrust has decreased in the U.S., at least that's my interpretation. Definitely, merger approval, it's open bar. That's for sure. There is just merger are always approved. So I think that one is clear. For antitrust, other measures might give you something different. Fines have, have gone up, so maybe it's a bit more ambiguous. But that one is very personal to me because I moved to the US in uh, exactly here, 1999. And I remember arriving in the US, and I was amazed. Everything was so cheap. Computers, laptops, were half the price than I had in Paris. Airline tickets were much cheaper, and phones were much cheaper. Okay? 
Today, it's the same, but when I fly back. Because, <laughs> like just to be one instance, if you have a cell phone like an iPhone, the minimum contract you're gonna pay per month in the US is $100 if you want to have a given amount of data. The same exact contract in Paris is 40 euros. All right, thank you. <laughs>
uh, research and development, which, does, which might not be measured as intellectual property uh, and, and other measures. But those are the main ones. This also makes clear that just looking at the time series is not going to resolve this issue. Um, because there's long-run trends here, and so both, uh, say, concentration is going up, as Thomas emphasized, but intangibles are also going up. Uh, so looking at the cross-section data and using that for identification is an important part of understanding what's happening uh, in, these, uh, in these data. So um, one thing... Thomas didn't emphasize in his paper, partially because of data limitations, is that much of what we're seeing is an effect um, that occurs in investment after 2000. So this is uh, based on looking at firm level data, and you see something uh, similar in the EU that when you put in all of the usual controls like Tobin's Q and cash flow and firm and uh, firm fixed effects, the time effects have a very clear pattern. Um, so you see on the uh, top here, the 70s and 80s, there were positive time effects. So that is investment overperforms. Okay. Uh, in the 1990s, the time effects are nearly zero. But these negative effects of the decline is really starts in 2000 uh, and is in effect throughout the 2000s. It's exacerbated by the financial crisis, but it starts well before then. Uh, and other authors, including some people here, have emphasized that there's the same time pattern when you look at productivity, that the productivity decline is actually initiated well before the, the financial crisis. Um, so this again, uh, raises the issue of identification because there are many things that change during the 2000s. Uh, so intangible investment picks up, but there are many other changes as well. So it leads us to looking at the cross-section. So this is a bit of a, a complicated chart, but it bears some similarities to things that uh, David Otter has worked on. I think illuminates a bit of what's happening across industry. So let me explain what we have here. Um, so the, the chart calculates the share of investment that's represented um, by industry. And here I'm using a slightly different definition of industry than one typically sees. So these are the Fama French industries. And the major difference relative to the NIPA or the national accounts industries uh, is by breaking out high tech from manufacturing and from services. Uh, it's very difficult to look at manufacturing as a whole over this period because the high tech manufacturing industry is growing strongly and investing, um, but the traditional old line manufacturing firms are, are declining. And this industry classification breaks them out. So on the left, you see that the investment is really shifting toward a set of industries that I've defined as non-tradables, which is mostly energy and telecommunications. And telecom here is not telecom devices, so it's not phones. It's telecom distribution. So the industries on the left to which investment is shifting are grounded industries or non-tradable industries where you're putting in pipelines and extraction and distribution towers and uh, networks. And so much of the investment in the US, and this goes back to the 1970s through 2015, has been in this I mean, literally fixed investment, not just fixed investment as equipment, but investment that's fixed in place. Uh, and the decline in investment, so where capital has been shifting away or investment has been shifting away, is in production sectors. And the production sectors, we're not surprised, uh, have seen a smaller share of investment uh, over time, and in particular, manufacturing durables and non-durables. The surprising part of this chart, I think, is the part on the right, where you might expect that high-growth industries, such as high-tech uh, and the investment industry here that's, that's health is health devices. Uh, you might expect there to be rising investment in high growth industries as well. So you might expect a U-shape uh, in, this, in this chart, but instead 
on the right hand side you have uh, the dog that doesn't bark. You have the high growth industries that are not investing. And, and this is part of the puzzle. This is where the, the gap resides that uh, Thomas is, uh, is emphasizing. The um, interesting uh, comparison here is also to think about the, a similar chart for labor markets that uh, David and his co-authors have drawn where you see the job polarization where there's a, there is actually the U-shaped uh, uh, result where you see employment shifting to non-tradables on the left, but also to skill, high-skilled uh, sectors on the right. But investment looks a bit different um, because you don't have the skill bias happening in investment that uh, we traditionally saw in employment. So investment looks a bit different than the labor market here. So when you see these gaps in investment, uh, given the measurement problems that we face, that should really be our first stop in trying to explain them. Uh, and there are surely measurement issues uh, broadly here. Certainly Q is very difficult to measure, but the strength of cash flow uh, in the US sort of enforces that we're probably not uh, going to explain our uh, investment puzzle with, entirely with mismeasured Q. Now, another place to go is to think perhaps we're just mis mismeasuring intangible investment. That there is a lot of intangible investment there. We're not picking it up, and that would fill the gap uh, in our investment regression. The difficulty there is when you actually think through how that works, it's, it, it's not as obvious as it sounds. So the typical story for mismeasured intangible investment is that firms are actually investing, say they're building software internally, or they're developing brand internally. And so rather than measuring that as capital investment, firms are expensing the labor expense and the materials expense that go into intangibles. But what that means is not only is investment too low, but expenses are too high, right? That you shouldn't be counting that labor expense and that materials expense as a cost, you should count it as an investment. Okay? And if that's right, then there's two things that are mismeasured. And when you look at net business savings, so you look at business savings, less investment, those two effects would net out. And there would be no effect on business savings. Okay? But in fact, we see huge changes in business savings. Right? In the direction, let me show you the chart, uh, this is net business savings, and in the earlier years, you see there it's significantly negative uh, in the U.S., which means that investment exceeds retained earnings, essentially. Investment exceeds savings, and so what the negative numbers are the financing gap that firms fill with external finance. But on the right-hand side, you see that, again, since the early 2000s, this number is significantly positive. So business saving, business is, the corporate sector is a net source of savings to the rest of the economy. And that's not a story that's just mismeasured intangibles. This says that savings is very high and firms are not investing. So this, there's two points from this. One is it's very consistent with uh, Thomas' story that financial frictions are not explaining low investment in the US. Because uh, it would be hard to uh, square financial frictions with this much net business savings. And secondly, it doesn't look as if the investment shortfall is entirely due to um, mismeasured intangibles. Looks like investment is low, even relative to, uh, to savings. Okay. So the other explanation um, is concentration. And this has been an interesting uh, highlight uh, out of recent work. Again, David uh, has done work on the labor share, which highlights the role of concentration there. And the, the current paper sh show a similar result for investment, that perhaps concentration can explain the gaps of the decline that we see in the labor share as well as in investment. This is a really intriguing idea uh, and is, um, is very thought-provoking. So in some ways, very simple. 
um, because if there's market power or if there's uh, decreasing returns to scale, marginal Q is less than average Q. And what we put in all of our regressions is average Q. And so it says we're overestimating the incentive to invest. And if there's market power, then Q is going to overstate investment exactly as Thomas's charts show. So it, it seems like a very appealing explanation. Uh, and I think there's a lot to it. And so we should push harder uh, on this and, and ask about it. Um, so first, do the data line up. So I'm using the charts here from uh, David's five co-author um, paper in the AER papers and proceedings. There's a longer paper. In, in this literature, there's always another longer paper um, that goes through all of the, the data and much more detail. But here they're measuring concentration ratio. So it's similar to what uh, Thomas is looking at in, in his data. And I'm going to emphasize the, the higher curves in blue and green because those are concentration ratios measured off sales. And you see that they're rising for a broad range of industries. So manufacturing is going up. Services goes up quite sharply. Retail trade, wholesale trade, a little more shallow increase utilities and transportation. So uh, a very widespread increase in concentration. But what I also want to point out is that their data goes back to 1980. Uh, so for all of the work that Thomas has done on data, the measures of concentration start in the late 1990s. And so for manufacturing, you see by the late 1990s, most of the increase in concentration has already occurred. Uh, and the same for services. The big increase in concentration in Otter's data is in the 1990s. So there's a bit of a puzzle here because remember the enforcement measure that Thomas showed spikes in the, in the 1990s. So this immediately for an empirical economist starts raising uh, endogeneity because you worry that when there was much more concentration, that is, there were more acquisitions then there was also more enforcement because what he's measuring is the number of cases. So you worry that what we're measuring is not so much the intensity of enforcement, but just the number of acquisitions that were brought forward. Now, of course, the number of acquisitions, the number of cases is endogenous as well. So this is not dispositive, um, but we just want to be careful uh, about the timing because it looks a little different in uh, David's data than, than it does in Thomas's. Um, let me skip David's finding. In the interest of time, he can uh, advertise his own work during the discussion. Um, so the question that we are left with is it, it looks like both concentration and um, intangibles have an effect on uh, investment, have a negative effect on investment. So we have to ask, what drives the increase in concentration? So if we're going to worry about endogeneity, and when you see that manufacturing is one of the main industries with rising concentration, uh, then the issue that arises to me is reverse causality. Um, because what may be happening, an alternative explanation, is that in a low growth industry, you, have, you would have had low investment anyway, and then that drives consolidation. And so the concentration is following from the low growth and the low investment, uh, rather than low investment following from concentration. Now, these are not mutually exclusive, but before we uh, implement policy, we certainly want to understand causality. Uh, and there are many reasons to think that um, in these sectors, so here's manufacturing as a share of uh, total value in the largest firms. Manufacturing is dramatically shrinking over time, whereas you're seeing high tech is this sort of blue-gray color is rising over time, and uh, other industries taken as a whole are rising over time as well. Okay. Um, you see similar patterns in the number of firms, so it's not only the va firm value uh, where you have the shrinkage and consolidation, but also in the number of firms, which you would expect. Okay. Um, similarly, new entry is in high-tech firms uh, and not in manufacturing firms. So in particular, most, the largest and most active 
uh, industries for new entry is business services. Business services, that's the same sector as uh, Microsoft and Facebook. Um, so there's much more activity there. So final question is concentration seems highly correlated with the decline in investment, but in order to take policy action, we want to know what drives concentration. It's clearly an endogenous variable. So is concentration ultimately the culprit, or is concentration a byproduct of other things happening in the industry and the industry equilibrium? Um, and there is an interesting um, uh, correlation between intangibles and the industry concentration. Because if firms are building market power, one way to do that is through building brand and also through intellectual property, which are both intangibles, uh, intangible investments. So these are not mutually exclusive. You, you've run out of time substantially. Okay. Sorry to say that. So we look forward to the discussion, because there are many open questions. Thomas, do you want to, uh, to give a first reaction to, uh, to Jenny's comments? Uh, maybe uh, we can cancel the two minus five plus five. And yeah, just then I'll say one thing, only one yeah, thing. I'm going to advertise my own research. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I agree with the endogeneity issue, which is it's plausible that if you see weak growth going forward, you're not going to invest, and you're going to try to consolidate. And that's exactly the point of the other paper we have on the US, where we come up with uh, three different identification strategy to exactly get that the causal effect of concentration of investment. So if you're interested, uh, then I, I can just recommend this paper. Thank you, Thomas. Before I open the floor, uh, does any of you want to come back or to comment on, uh, to cross comment on each other's paper? Just one, uh, just one uh, short comment. I, th I think that the increase in, in intangibles uh, um, also has some roots in the harmonization of these systems that I mentioned at the end of my presentation. It makes it much easier for businesses to go international to expand brands, patent families, and other things. And that adds, of course, to the, to, uh, to the cost of doing so. And that's what you capture on the data. One question, if I may, I wanted to ask you, Thomas, is about uncertainty, which, which features in your paper, but something we know about investment dynamics and, I mean, and in, the, uh, in, the, in the Tobin School literature, and Jadis, you've written, you've written about it, is uh, that investment can be lumpy, uh, adjustment costs can be nonlinear, I mean, marginal adjustment costs can be nonlinear, um, which can explain, go some way ex towards explaining why firms are not investing. Uh, and the more uncertainty, uh, the more the value of waiting. That's something we've learned. So, I mean, would that fit in the story that uh, there would be uh, more, either more lumpiness because it's when coming with intangible investment uh, in the US, or uh, maybe more uncertainty in Europe, holding back investment, which is not what, you've, what you have in your conclusion, but that's something that uh, you, you could, uh, you could uh, imagine is happening, that uncertainty would be also would be creating some value of waiting. Yeah, so absolutely. Uh, there is no question that you could have a, a value of delay if you have more uncertainty. My sense from looking at the data is that uncert political uncertainty, uncertainty about the future of the Eurozone was a huge factor in Europe. My sense is it's fully priced in into Tobin's Q. So one of the reasons Tobin's Q works so well is because every time you have a spike in uncertainty about a country or a development in the Eurozone, you see Q going down. So I think it's working pretty well in that. But, and that, by the way, is exactly what the theory would predict, because uncertainty is just one type of risk premium, and every single type of risk premium works in Q. The adjustment cost story is a bit different. It's about how fast can the industry pick up uh, after the risk premium go down. Um, so that's more like, yeah, if we believe there are these strong nonlinearities, it might take more time than we think for investment to pick up uh, in Europe. Um, for the US, I just don't buy the uncertainty story at all. Period. Now we can debate it, but that's my view. And the other thing is, the more you believe in intangible, the, the less you should believe in, uh, in uncertainty. Because the thing with intangible investment, especially in human capital, is there is no, there is no gap between the timing of investment and, and that of cash flow. You pay people as you go along when to write software. So in that world, uncertainty is the second order issue. So I don't think that explains anything in the US. I think uncertainty in the US is a shortcut for tax cut. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Let me open the floor for discussion. 
please, so we have, uh, we have uh, 20 minutes or so. Um, let me remind you that this discussion is webcasted. Uh, so you may, all of you may more or less know each other in the room. Uh, this is also for the benefit of all those who are watching us. So please introduce yourself. Uh, so, Kristen. So the mic, uh, mic is coming. So I will take like two, three questions uh, and then uh, hand it back to the, to the uh, speakers. Kristen Forbes from MIT. So two very thought-provoking papers. I have one question for each. Um, <laughs> so first, David, you focus on the effect of productivity growth on labor market quantities, on employment. Have you also done any work where you look at the impact on wages? Uh, for example, in the sectors that have higher productivity growth, do you also get some of that in the form of higher wage growth, even if less employment? And then what happens to the labor share in those sectors, or do most of the gains go to capital? Um, Tomas, and actually Janice also, neither of you mentioned in all of your comments the fact that U.S. companies have roughly $2.5 trillion of cash kept abroad, at least some of which is probably held there because companies are hoping to see some sort of temporary permanent reduction in the tax rate for when they bring that money back into the U.S. Could that affect any of your estimates of why some of that is not being used for investment or affect your estimates of Tobin Q and it will affect some of your end results? So Richard, please. Uh, Richard Baldwin, president of the Center of Economic Policy Research. <clears throat> David, um, I was a little surprised not to hear the word China in your entire presentation, um, international factors. Uh, what is it, is the fi are the fixed effects picking up the China shock or in particular, what I worried is that the very rapid drop in the price of manufacturing due to China's emergence is getting into your productivity numbers, and thus you're ascribing some things to productivity which you probably ascribe to China. I mean, it's this basic idea that American workers are competing against China abroad and robots at home, and it's very difficult to sort out which is which, and, and I'd just like for you to comment on that. Thank you. Sylvester? <coughs> yeah, the one. I have uh, one question to David and one remark to Thomas. Uh, my question to David is the following. Uh, well, you showed that it's not only the lower mi middle classes, but it's also coming to the professionals, including central bankers. And what you see nowadays that with artificial intelligence, that uh, fintech, order tech, legal tech, and if you see the dropping of numbers of corporate finance mem members, uh, auditors, etc. It's hard. So that means that we have to educate. Okay? I'm Sylvester Evenman. I'm a senior manager at Tilburg University, so we confronted with that. Five to ten years, we have to uh, have a different educational system, including data science and artificial intelligence for all our professionals. So that's my question. What do you think? Is it rather five to ten years? My remark to Thomas has to do with one explanation which I was missing. That's the difference between, in the Tobin skew explanation, difference between the stakeholder model, which is typical for Europe, uh, the Rheinland model, maybe you can call it, and the shareholder model, which is typical for the US. You see nowadays that we are confronted in Europe, especially in the Netherlands, with a loss of hostile takeovers by private equity firms, Unilever, Axel Nobel, we can continue. And why? Because they are focused on value creation in the long run in servicing their stakeholders, which is a completely different model way, like in the US and especially with private equity firms. So Thomas, maybe, well, you could include that in one of your intangibles in your, it's very difficult, but maybe you can give your opinion about that as well. So let me take one last question for this round and there will be another round, Marco Boutier. Thank you. I have a question on cross papers. Um, two uh, relevant results uh, in, in the first place, uh, you have uh, in uh, David uh, uh, find, finds lower spillovers in the in, in recent years, and you have in uh, Tuma um, higher concentration, uh, industry concentration in the uh, in the US, especially in the US. Now, can we have a relation between these two? Um, I mean, if you have higher concentration, industry concentration, you have more appropriation of the productivity gains, so possibly less uh, uh, lower spillovers, uh, you know, going hand in hand with uh, 
lower level of, uh, of investment. So does this story convince you? Uh, and the second point then would be uh, immediately following is that if it is true that uh, you know, the good news for Europe is that uh, there is, according to uh, Toma, there is a lower, let's say, investment due to cyclical uh, conditions rather than structural conditions. Maybe once these uh, uh, cyclical conditions are over, and hopefully that is going to be the case uh, uh, soon, then you may have more positive spillovers uh, in Europe. So maybe you have a virtuous uh, cycle there. Is uh, daydreaming? Okay. Back to the speakers. David, do you want to start? Uh, sure. Should I, should I try to answer all five questions? <laughs> yep. Oh, okay. Whichever. Whichever. Uh, 42. Okay. Uh, so first on the, the, the question of um, wage bill and labor share. So uh, we, we, we didn't in this paper look at the wage bill component. It's a, it's a valid question. Uh, we, um, but it, it, it follows naturally. We know that the relative wage of skilled workers have been rising. We know that there's not a within industry shift towards skilled workers in the, more, in the sectors that have greater productivity, but we know the wage bill share must be rising in aggregate, uh, and that partly is a function of the cross-sectoral shifts. Right? So uh, it definitely, our story where these, this unbalanced growth is raising demand for skilled workers would be one where the wage bill share of skilled workers is rising. You asked about the relationship that to labor share, and this is something that uh, many are working on, uh, myself included, uh, looking at the uh, change in concentration and what we, we know in aggregate that labor share has been falling across the uh, developed and developing world, even China. Uh, it is associated with rising industry concentration and uh, we conjecture that it also, uh, the, the, the same phenomenon of what we call superstar firms, which are firms that are capital intensive uh, and highly profitable, and they command a growing share of output, um, that that is also related to the concentration of wages. And that, that's, the, that's a conjecture. It's not something we confirmed the work by Jay Song and Nick Bloom and others shows this sort of uh, the, the, the between firm component of rising wage inequality, also visible in Germany, high wage firms, highly skilled workers, increasing covariance between them. Uh, we hypothesize that this mechanism is, uh, is leading to wage concentration. Um, and so it's important to distinguish that uh, I, I said jokingly about the falling labor share being the first horseman of the robocalypse. Um, it's not the case that labor share is falling on average across firms, an unweighted average. It's that the firms, larger firms, more profitable firms, have lower labor share and their weight in aggregate output is rising. And that's the key contributor. Um, the question on China. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I didn't mention that because our data don't directly speak to that, but I, I, of course, that has been one of the key labor market disruptions for the US particularly in the 2000s. Uh, and I think it's contributed a lot to our fall in employment to population ratios. You might say, well, why hasn't the same thing happened in Europe? Well, um, to a substantial degree, Chinese goods in Europe substituted for imports that were coming from elsewhere already, that many, many of those manufacturers were already not being produced in Europe. The US, you know, being so large and actually being a relatively low skill country by the advanced country standards, produced a lot more textiles and leather goods and dolls uh, than you, uh, you would, than has been produced here in quite a while. Um, but obviously China is extremely important and that also raises the question when we think about the declining spillovers, um, that could partly have to do with import substitution and that's something that's on our agenda to look at. And even the productivity gains could, as you said, be exaggerated by import competition. This is something that Sue Hausman has worked on a lot to show that uh, some of what looks like productivity gains are actually just substitution of imported products that are not correctly accounted for in national accounts. Um, on the question about you know, central bankers being automated, <laughs> uh, you know, I, was amused, uh, I was amused by the Fry and Osborne to say that you know, apparently clergy also have a 20% yeah. chance of being automated. I was wondering how that works. Uh, very low, very low. It's low, but still it's not zero. So clearly, you know, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's some automation. Because, um, you know, productivity hasn't been rising in clerical right. work as far as I can tell. The sort of the bandwidth of the deity is pretty stable. Um, so I, I, I think the, uh, you know, I, I, what, what appears to be the case from a lot of data that I've seen actually is not the rising importance of technical skills, but it's actually interpersonal skills, problem solving skills, managerial skills, interactive skills. 
uh, work from Sweden shows that there is rising return to uh, you know, non-cognitive interactive traits. Uh, and in the US, it's not the case that the highest tech occupations, the pure math science occupations are growing. It's the uh, jobs that combine uh, management with technical expertise. So I actually think human comparative advantage lies in uh, expertise, judgment, and creativity. And that those, you know, if we just want to be better calculators, we're going to, but that's a race we're not going to win. Uh, it's really our comparative advantage is the flexibility and the ability to bring both our, uh, you know, our refined expertise, but also our, you know, panoply of insights and uh, our sensitivity to direct situations. So I think uh, it, it's not that education needs to be just stemmier and stemmier. It needs to be broad and allow people to be adaptive. Um, so I, let me end up quickly. So the, uh, the, this question about uh, spillovers, again, I, th I think the, the, the China component may be an important part of that. We really need to do the input-output linkages on that. I think it's also, and on the final question, about the relationship with concentration and spillovers, I think that's quite plausible. That, in other words, rising concentration means that we have sort of superstar firms, they're very profitable, they're not investing strongly, they're holding on to a lot of cash, and that would tend to reduce the spillover. So I, I you know, I don't want to offer a grand unifying theory, but I, I do think this nexus between a concentration of economic activity, which may not just be antitrust, by the way, which may be that, uh, you know, that uh, information intensive goods, improved search, give strong market dominance to firms with a cost advantage or a technological advantage. Um, they have effects not just on the uh, share of labor, but where the investment money goes and the investment output goes, and also which sets of workers benefit. And I think that remains a very uh, first order topic that I'm heartened to see many researchers are, uh, are exploring and making progress on. Dietmar, do you want to say a word? I just wanted to make one comment that uh, uh, is related to what uh, uh, David just said. Uh, if we have an increasing uh, importance of a financing mechanism via venture capital and so forth, then we also have a selection of business models into scalability. That's the first thing a venture capitalist asks you. Is this scalable? And that means uh, trying to get away from high labor shares. So uh, I, I would like to see your uh, the, the, the the latest paper, the super super firm paper, uh, um, broken out with respect to uh, financing form and uh, sort of the the origin of the company, because I would expect some selectivity in there uh, that may not be as strong here in Europe as uh, we just build these sectors of financing. Just one quick comment to that. Uh, quick, the, yeah. the irony is in the finance sector, labor share is rising. You might think it would be just the opposite, right? All the automation. But in fact, uh, a lot of the rents are accruing to workers. Uh, and the importance of sort of sales and personal services is, is rising. I'm not saying that's a healthy development, but it's, it's the opposite of what intuition would suggest, where you just think, well, it's all robo-investors and lights out. But, but if you need expertise and sure. judgment and creativity to do these deals and sure. to find out which teams should be financed, then that will be in line with what you said before. Right? Mm -hmm. Don't know. Um, okay, so quickly then, <clears throat> so Christine's question on, the, yeah, so I guess there are two parts. One is a measurement issue, and uh, when we define turbine skewed, you net out financial assets and, and liabilities, so you don't pick up any kind of excess cash they have as part of the valuation. Um, but there's a deeper issue, of course, of firms operating abroad, so when we measure investment in the national accounts, in the industry accounts, at the firm level, they don't represent the same thing. You know, sometimes it's measured domestic investment, sometimes it's firm consolidated. So that's why we do both, and we check that none of the results we uh, emphasize is driven by firms that, say, invest only abroad. Um, they are, and the last point that's very important, which, again, I didn't have time to do justice to, is when we look at Herfindahl indexes, then there is a big issue when competition comes from abroad. And so we've created now, uh, we've almost finished com completing uh, a new set of Herfindahl measures that actually adjust for foreign competition. Okay. Otherwise, you get nonsensical results. So all of that is taken care of. Um, China, of course, Richard, is not just for the labor share. It's big time for investment. And in fact, in the paper that I mentioned earlier, China is one of the instruments we use to look at an exogenous shift in competition. Um, 
shareholders and stakeholders, uh, Sebastian's question. Yes, big time. In fact, we have a paper specifically on that on the US because, uh, but that's, I can't you know, give you the details, but the one thing that's important in the US, which is, tends to be a bit more US specific, is when the typical measure of Herfindahl is defined by firms. But if two firms are the same owners, then should you count them as one firm or two firms? Now you might think it's not a big deal because, the, because of dispersion in shareholders, except that in the US, there's rising concentration of large money managers. So now, oftentimes in an industry, among the top five firms, you're gonna have large money managers owning 20% of each. Are they really gonna compete that much? That's an open question. It turns out in the data, the answer is that it has a strong impact. And if you build a hair final index that adjusts for this overlap, actually first, it predicts better what's actually going on in terms of investment. And two, of course, its concentration is rising even faster. And um, so then I tend to think, but then we can disagree. I tend to think more in terms of uh, the horizon of the shareholders and what factors could be pushing towards short-termism versus non-short-termism. And that's a very complicated question. But we do find some evidence of increased short-termism. I'm not sure it's all private equity. I think it's also, well, I guess it depends where you put the hedge funds in there. Um, but activists, you know. Um, so, uh, so that's, so yes, I think it's there. And we don't see that much of that in Europe so far. Um, and Marco's point, uh, I agree with what David said. Um, that, yeah, I think that, that there's probably a link, and in fact, it connects to what Jan was saying about the labor share. Uh, I mean, you know, it's in equilibrium, uh, you know, the market is P over W, and then the labor share is W over P. So if one goes up, the other one goes down. It's as simple as that. Um, so th for sure, there's a link between the two. I think the tricky question is to understand changes in the technology at the same time, because you have two things shifting at the same time. You have the Competitive capital share, which is moving because of intangible investment, and then you have the product market rent. And we observe the residue of the two, and the challenge is to separate them. Jen? Okay, just uh, a quick comment. I completely agree with Thomas's response on the um, cash held abroad. I think it's well accounted for in their methodology. Um, on the shareholders versus stakeholders question, it comes out very dramatically in the chart I showed on net business savings where you see the accumulation of net business savings. And as Thomas's paper showed, one um, uh, allocation of that is to uh, share repurchases and dividend payouts. And so that likely has much to do with the, with the point that you emphasize, but it's very dramatic in the, in the data uh, for the US. Uh, the last point on how these things tie together with concentration, I think, is a very interesting one. Um, and, but it could, it could go in many ways, because you could see that concentration um, might limit the spillovers across firms. So if there's less dynamism in an industry because it's more, there's more monopoly power, it could play the role of limiting the kind of spillovers and why we see that reduction that, that you report in the, in the 2000s. On the other hand, if the concentration is resulting from acquisitions, and so you're seeing consolidation, and, and note that Q theory is silent on whether firms invest by new capital investment or by acquisitions, either could be the result of high Q. So if, the, if it's, you're, if the result of high Q is that there's acquisitions, then that might be a way in which these spillovers are actually implemented uh, across firms, as you take the, the low Q, less dynamic firm is incorporated into the high Q, more dynamic firm. Uh, so I think that's an empirical uh, question that's outstanding. Thank you, Janice. We are going to uh, close it uh, now because we've run out of time, so I apologize to both of you wanted to ask Aww. more questions. I'm sorry about that. Uh, you have a chance to ask questions in the next session. So that's a legacy I hand over and to Peter. Um, I think we've done a very good job at uh, sowing the seeds for the policy discussion, that, which Peter will lead in a, uh, in a moment after the coffee break. Uh, and we've also make, made the case that uh, this conference cannot be automated, definitely. So thank you very much. Thank you.